After victory, there is a celebration. I think one of my most vivid memories of that kind of thing is when a football team wins the championship. They ceremoniously take a bucket full of Gatorade and pour it over the head of the coach. And then they get in the locker room and pour champagne over the heads of each other. One of my interesting observations is that they will then get before a microphone and say, We won! I'm going to Disneyland. Now, I don't know this, but I suspect Disneyland paid them for that commercial. At any rate, it sounds like the way they're going to celebrate is they're going to go to Disneyland. Perhaps the way most people celebrate anything is they throw a party. Now, what I want to talk about is celebration. How should believers celebrate a victory? Maybe I should ask, does the Lord ever give you a, brick, a victory of some sort? Does the Lord ever bless you? Then how do you celebrate that victory? How do you celebrate that blessing that God has poured out upon you? Well, perhaps there are many answers to that. But one of them is in Judges chapter 5. So will you turn with me to Judges chapter 5? And while you're turning, let me explain a couple of things. In the book of Judges chapter 4, there was a war led by a lady named Deborah. Chapter 5 is the celebration of the victory that was won in chapter 4. These two chapters really go together. And what is in chapter 5? The way she celebrated was she wrote and she and another fella sang a song. That song uh, is uh, the equivalent of a celebration. Uh, matter of fact, I probably a good parallel might be the army's gone off to war, they've won, they've come back, and there's a ticker tape parade in New York. That's something of what's going on in this chapter. It's a celebration. And it's a celebration by singing a song. If I were going to summarize everything that's in this chapter in one word, or several, I would say this passage is about praise the Lord. Matter of fact, I would say that the way they celebrated the victory in chapter 4 is they sang praises to the Lord in chapter 5. So, this is a song. And as with many songs, this has stanzas. And there are a number of ways to divide the chapter. I'm going to suggest we look at four stanzas in this song. One other little observation. In a lot of music, there is repetition, from classical music to popular music to Christian music. There is often a repetitious phrase in the song, and that is true here. So what I'm gonna, some of what I'm going to say as we move through this passage is repetitious, but that's because it is the nature of a song. Now, it's an extremely long passage. There are 31 verses in Judges chapter 5. So rather than read the whole thing, I'm going to move through some of the verses and summarize portions of the chapter as well. So let's begin with the first two verses. They make up what I'm going to call the first stanza. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinam, sang on that day, saying, When leaders led in Israel, when the people willingly followed uh, offered themselves, bless the Lord. Now, that's the point. Bless the Lord. That is his point. Now, notice that two people are singing this song, Deborah and Barak. Most feel that only Deborah wrote it because of some things that are said later in the passage, but it's a duet. They are singing a duet. And uh, it's a call to praise the Lord, uh, which is indicated at the end of verse 2. Bless the Lord. So this song is an invitation, if you will, a call 
to praise the Lord. What is interesting, and this is not only true in these opening verses, but throughout the chapter, is that he's gonna, she's going to praise the Lord, and that involves people somehow. So in this case, he says, she says in verse 2, when leaders lead in Israel and when people willingly offer themselves. Now what she's talking about is that in chapter 4, the leaders, at least in some of the tribes, led in this military campaign that ultimately resulted in victory. And the people in at least some of the tribes offered themselves to go with these leaders and conquer the Canaanites so that they could have victory. So she's saying, bless the Lord because of what the leaders and the laymen did in producing this victory. Now, verse 3 is also part of this first stanza. And there he says, she says, Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will praise uh, I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Now this is really interesting to me. Verse 2 is an invitation for all the people to praise the Lord. Bless the Lord. Verse 3 says, now we're going to sing and I want you to listen. Well, who does they want to listen? Who does she want to listen to this duet? And she says, kings, now wait a minute, we're in the book of Judges. There are no kings in Israel at this point. Matter of fact, this is one of the major points of the whole book, that there are no kings in Israel. We get to the end of the book, in the last few chapters, he's going to say that over and over. There was no king in Israel. That's one of the major points of the book. And yet, she says, I want kings to give ear, and I want princes to listen to this song that we are going to sing. So that leads me to the conclusion that she is asking pagans to listen. These aren't kings and princes of Israel. They are kings and princes of other lands. So she's saying, we're going to sing a duet and we want everybody to listen to us sing. And she says, if you listen to this song, here's what you're going to hear. I will sing to the Lord. That's interesting. They're singing a duet. They want the people to listen. But they're not singing to the people. They're singing to the Lord. And here's what we're singing about. I will sing praise to the Lord, our God of Israel. So here's the picture. First stanza. We're going to sing praise to the Lord. We're going to address it to him. And we're going to let you listen. Now I looked at that passage and I thought, boy, is that ever interesting. Hmm. Uh, first thing I thought is, uh, I, this is one way the pagans could know the Lord, right? We sing and they learn about the Lord. And the second thing I thought about was, well, uh, they would not only learn about the Lord, they had learned to praise. And about that time I thought, huh, the unbelievers need to learn how to praise? The unbelievers need to know the Lord? Yes. Yeah. Do they need to learn how to praise? Yes. Yeah. And I was sitting at my desk looking over this passage and um, I was, uh, I'd already gone through the whole passage some time ago, but I, I was thinking about this passage in terms of teaching it today. And I thought, boy, you know, the world is full of criticism, cynicism, yep. condemnation, negativism. Matter of fact, it's almost sometimes hard to listen to the news. I mean, it just, it is so... So negative. And I thought, yeah, that, that's right. They, they, they need to learn, they need to know the Lord, and they need to learn to praise the Lord because there's so much negativism in the world. So I think we could make a difference on that front. Amen. Yes. Amen. So I took a break, and I have a habit 
I read the paper every day. So I decided to take a break in my study. I'd been at it for a while, and I decided to go read the paper. I opened the paper, and here's what I read. Facebook is sued over photo scams. And on the same page, Walmart sues Visa over pens. I thought, I'm not even going to read those. All right, that's fine. Turn the page. Next page. Super Shuttle is suing state. <laughs> I was right about my observation in James, or Judges 4 or 5. They need to learn to praise the Lord, and we need to quit suing each other and learn to praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. That stands a one. We need a duet. Sing to this pagan place so they can learn about the Lord and learn to praise Him. So, this first stanza is praising the Lord and the emphasis is on the people rose up and did something. And that causes us to praise the Lord. So when you see God's people serving the Lord, that ought to provoke you to praise. Which is what Paul does in the epistles, isn't it? He writes to these various churches and he says uh, something like, I thank God for what's going on in your life and church. Then there's the second stanza. That begins in verse 4. And again, the subject is praise, only this time we're going to talk a little differently. Uh, look at verse 4. Lord, when you went out of Sarah, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured. Now notice that little phrase, the heavens poured. Poured. If you were with me when we talked about chapter 4, you will recall that the Canaanites had chariots of iron. Remember that? They were the uh, weapons of the day. They were the state-of-the-art weaponry. But they were made of iron. And that it is suggested by this verse, and later in verse, I think it's 21, somewhere down toward the end of the chapter, that what happened is the Lord brought a, a rainstorm and the chariots got stuck. So what Deborah is doing here is she's writing a song and she said, Lord, you let it rain. Praise you, because that was significant in giving us the victory. So he, she says in the latter part of verse 4, the earth trembled, the heavens op uh, poured, and the clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord, this Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. She is saying, uh, this was like what happened at Sinai. God appeared on the scene. That's the point. Now, we're still in the second stanza, but what she's going to do is talk about the situation that needed this victory she's just described. She says in verse 6, In the days of Shamgar, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted, the travelers walked along the byways, the village life ceased, it ceased in Israel, and until I, Deborah, arose arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then there was war in the gates. Not a shield or a spear was seen among the 40,000 in Israel. Now, this is a song. It's poetry. It's not laid out chronologically. But if I were going to, to unravel it, I would start with verse 8. They chose new gods. That is, the children of Israel became idolatrous. They started worshiping other gods. And the Lord withdrew his blessing at that point. And so verse 8 says, there was war in the gates. So there was idolatry followed by war. And then it says, and they were weaponless. Nor, not a spear nor a shield was seen among the 40,000 of Israel. So here's what's going on. They served other gods. 
then they get attacked, and now they have no way to defend themselves. And that's the problem. So the result of that, now let's back up to verse 6, the highways were deserted. In other words, because of this war, the Canaanites controlled the land, and they weren't able to travel on the highways for fear of being robbed, attacked, and killed. The travelers walked along the byways. They didn't take the highways. They took the byways for fear that the Canaanites would attack them. He says in verse 7, the village life ceased. Now, there were cities that had walls around them, and they had some protection. Out in the villages, they had no walls. They were unprotected. So his point here is that life stopped uh, in the villages even because of the Canaanites controlling and conquering the land. And then, well, this part of the stanza says, when the Lord, verse 4, but what did he do? Well, he sent rain and he did something else. I want you to look at the end of verse 7. Until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. The situation is desperate. They're being conquered. They're being controlled. They're being killed. They can't move. So what did God do? He raised up a mother. Mother said, enough is enough. You're messing with my children. Don't mess with mama when somebody's messing with mama's children. So that is what's going on in this passage. And she said, the Lord worked. He raised up a mother. Now, this is in the book of Judges. We think of Samson, this big, strong, strapling guy, muscle bound. We think of Gideon with his 300 to go conquer an enemy. What does God do? God raises up a mother. God raises up a mother. Interesting stuff. God delights in using women and mothers. I spoke on this last week when we were in chapter 4 and talked about the fact that he uses mothers and that we're very often not aware of just the impact they have. Uh, Matter of fact, uh, I, I, I have been fairly analytical about my life, I think, because of my interest in spiritual things and some interest in psychology and I've done a little self-analysis and my brother's a therapist and we kick things around. And recently, at my age, my brother said to me, you know why you're like that? And I said, no, what are you talking about? He said, it's because of your mother. Now my brother told me that. And I thought, you know what? He's right. That's exactly right. Uh, now you want to know what it was he said. I can tell. Right, 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 right. It's, we were talking about the fact that I tend to be very, very cognitive and logical. I mean, I am boom, 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 boom. And one of the things that tends to irritate me is when somebody isn't logical and they make just absolutely stupid conclusions without facts and, you know... <laughs> So I was complaining to my brother about this, and he said, you know where you got that? I said, no, where did I get this? I thought it's, you know, I'm a Greek. The Greeks started the philosophers, you know. No, 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 no. He said, you got that from your mother. You reacted to your mother, who was very illogical. And I thought, busted. That is really, really true. Now, in this case, it was a negative influence, But I really, my mother was very superstitious. My mother even read tea leaves. And as a young kid, I reacted to her reading tea leaves. And I wasn't a Christian and we didn't go to church or anything like that. I just thought, that is ridiculous. You can't, those tea leaves can't predict what's going to happen. She believed it did. And I reacted. And from that moment on, I decided it's got to make sense to me. It's got to be logical. The point I'm making now is, Both positively and negatively, our mothers have an enormous impact on us. 
And in this case, a mother impacted a nation because she went and recruited a general and said, hey, it's your time to go fight. And he said, well, well, well I won't do this without you coming along. What, do you got to have a mother to go to war? Yeah. So she went with him and they were victorious and now we're singing about it. The point is, God uses mothers and women to the extent that I think we're very often unaware. So he's simply saying the Lord worked. And in this case, he worked through a woman, a mother. So he says in verse 9, My heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. Now notice, verse 9 is virtually a repetition of verse 2. And again, the point is, the Lord is to be praised because the Lord worked through people. And he says that very clearly in verse 2. He says it again in verse 9. Only now in verse 9, it specifically refers to a mother. So he says in verse 10, Speak you who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire, who walk along the road. Far from the noise of archers among the watering places, they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts of his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. Now, what's going on in this passage is incredibly interesting to me. He says, now look, you're to bless the Lord. Who is to bless the Lord? Well, if you ride on a white donkey, bless the Lord. If you sit in judges' attire, bless the Lord. If you walk along the road, bless the Lord. Now, who are these people? Well, those who ride on donkeys are probably the rulers. Those who sit, you ride, you sit, you walk. Those who sit in judges' attire are the wealthy. And those who walk along the roadside, uh, some say that's the middle class, and some say those are the poor people. But they're obviously not the rulers and the wealthy. So he's saying, look, everybody ought to praise the Lord and you ought to do it everywhere. So in verse 11, he says, far from the noise of the archers, get away from the battle and go to the watering hole. I think we'd say today, if you work in corporate America, go to the water cooler uh, and go to the gates. That was city hall. And he's saying, what you need to do is praise the Lord everywhere. Do it at the wall, the water, the wells, I should say, and do it at the gates that's in the wall. Praise the Lord everywhere. Amen. Now, I told you there was repetition today, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to repeat myself. We need to praise the Lord yes, we everywhere. Do. I've been making an issue for some time out of praising the Lord in the church service on Sunday morning. And I got that idea by reading the Psalms. And I bumped into a couple of Psalms where it said, I'm going to praise the Lord in the house of the Lord. Or I'm going to praise the Lord among the Lord's people. Psalm 116 is one example. There are others, several others. So I would like to make a suggestion. Take note of God's blessings on you, the victories that God gives you, and collect them so that when we gather together on Sunday morning and have this time of silent prayer, you have something to say. Is that a good idea? So praise the Lord, the water cooler. Praise the Lord in the parking lot. Praise the Lord in the middle of a church service. Praise the Lord. So if you ride a white donkey, praise the Lord. If you ride a black Chevy, praise the Lord. You have nice clothes, praise the Lord. You don't have nice clothes, praise the Lord. If you walk by the way, your soul, your, the soles of your shoes have holes in them, praise the Lord. That's what this passage is saying. It's a song that says, we need to praise the Lord. Amen. That's the second stanza. The first stanza said we need to praise the Lord because he worked through people. The second stanza seems to be saying 
Praise the Lord because he worked, especially through a mother. The third stanza begins in verse 12. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away. Now look, the picture here is they're asleep. Could that happen to people that know the Lord? Hey, Deborah, she's addressing herself. She wrote the song. Wake up. I, I've been sleeping. I, instead of doing what the Lord wanted us to do, we've been letting this go on probably for 20 years. The Canaanites had conquered them. And, and, and I've been sleeping. Wake up. Don't put up with this. Go do something. And by the way, that goes for Barry too. You wake up. And when you wake up and do something, then what you need to do is sing. Translated, wake up, serve the Lord, and when he blesses you, praise him. Amen. Do it in song. Do it in prayer. Do it in talking. But praise the Lord. Amen. Then he says in verse 13, Then the survivors came down, the people against the nobles. The Lord came down from... For me against the mighty. He's just saying again that uh, they woke up. That's verse 12. And when they did, the, the people came and engaged in battle against the Canaanites. And the Lord worked. That's the point. Now, what happens in the next several verses? And I'm not going to go through all the details. I just want you to notice that he's talking about the various tribes. So in verse 14, he talks about Ephraim and Benjamin. In verse 15, he also talks about Zebulun. And in verse 15, he talks about Issachar. Now, if you read these verses carefully, and we don't have time to go through all the details, what he's doing is he's saying, these four tribes came to help us. They woke up and did something. They went out and started serving the Lord. That's the point of those verses. These four tribes did something. Now remember, the theme that runs throughout all of these verses is praise the Lord because he did something through people. And in this case, he did it through four of the tribes. And then in verse 16, he mentions another tribe. Uh, he mentions Reuben. Only Reuben did not wake up. So he says in verse 16, Why did you sit among the sheepfold to hear the pipings of, for the flocks? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. <laughs> Why did you sit among the sheepfolds? These other four tribes joined us. They did something. Praise God. But not everybody did. Tribe of Reuben sat on their hands. Now, I just find this most, most fascinating. That's almost like he looked at modern Christianity. Some get up and work. Some praise the Lord. And some sit on their hands. And they have nothing to say but listening to the babbling of sheep in the sheepfold. They don't serve the Lord, and consequently, they have no praise. By the way, which camp are you in? Now, he then goes on and concludes this stanza by saying that uh, there were other tribes who, who uh, didn't work either. Verse 17, he says, Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. They were permanently residents of the east side of Jordan. And they didn't come over to the west side of Jordan and help us. They just sat on their hands. And Dan remained on ships. They decided it was time to go sailing. Asher continued at the seashore and stayed by its inlets, his inlets. Isn't this interesting? Here are more tribes. Gilead. Dan and Asher, they did nothing. So four tribes engaged and four tribes did nothing. I looked at this passage and I thought, isn't that interesting? Some of them, 
stayed by the mountains, and some of them went to the seashore, and I thought of Southern California. Where were you Sunday? Oh, well, we went to the beach, or the desert, or the mountains. You know, we just didn't get engaged like we should have. Then he ends this stanza by saying there were two tribes who risked their very lives. Verse 18, Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death, and Naphtali also to the height of the battlefield. So the point now is he shifted from praise the Lord because of what people have done, but not everybody woke up. Not everybody did it. Not everybody was engaged, and therefore not everybody praised. So maybe the point of this stanza is we should praise the Lord even when others don't. Amen. Even when others don't work, we should work. Somebody has said that they pointed out that Reuben was on the east side of the Jordan. They weren't closely connected to the tribes on the west side. And so this author says, the more remote the tribes stayed at home and did not participate in the war. They were remote. They weren't connected. Interesting. He goes on to say, the lack of tribal unity in Israel was there that only increased as time passed. And then he says this, a voluntary lack of fellowship with other believers will inevitably produce a lack of enthusiasm for God's work. It just is real interesting to me that, you know, you talk to some people and they say, well, I worship God. I, you can worship God. You don't have to go to church to worship God. You can worship him at the beach. And you say, you know what, that's true. But you don't, do you? That's the problem. But you don't, do you? You know, you need, to, you need the fellowship of believers to be reminded. You need to be engaged with believers. And the further remote you are, you're on the east side of the Jordan, the less involved you are in serving the Lord. It is real easy to get out of the habit of gathering with God's people. And when you do, it affects you spiritually. Make no doubt about it. Remember years ago, reading the story of a pastor who was visiting a fellow who had stopped attending church. And the guy was giving him all the arguments for why he didn't have to go to church. And they were sitting by a fireplace, and he says, well, why is it so important? And the pastor took the poker and he separated one coal from the fire. And they watched it as it slowly cooled off. And he said, that's what happens. When you're not connected with believers, you cool off. You need the warmth of other believers to keep your fire going. So Deborah is saying... Here are these people, they were at a distance from the Lord, Reuben, they were on the east side of Jordan, and they didn't do diddly squat. My translation of what this passage means. I'm not even sure I know what diddly squat means, but it's in here. Another author said, the people of God today are not unlike the people of Israel when it comes to doing God's, uh, come, uh, when it comes to God's call for service. Some immediately volunteer and follow the Lord. Some risk their lives. Some give the call serious consideration and say no. And others keep to themselves as though the call had never been given. Which one of those groups are you in? One more. Another commentator said, Scripture notes carefully those who fought in the battle and those who stood passively by, unwilling to risk their safety in Jehovah's cause. And so it is today. The Lord knows who is actively confronting the world and the devil and who is sitting back and simply watching. There is a time of reward coming, but it's also a time of loss of reward. All right? Said there was repetition. Praise the Lord because of what he's done. Praise the Lord because of what he's done through people. 
Praise the Lord, even when some people don't serve the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. So, one more stanza. And, again, there's a lot of repetition. He says in verse 19, um, The kings came and fought. Uh, That is, the Canaanites came. Then he says in verse 20, And they fought from the heavens, and the stars on their courses fought against Sisera. And again, he's talking about this rain that came out of heaven. And again, the point is the Lord worked. When the Canaanites came, the rains came. Then he says something else. The Lord cursed some people in verse 23. Uh, And that goes through verse uh, 23 and... Uh, Then he says in verse, uh, he cursed in verse 23, he blesses in verse 24. Also blessed among the women is Jael. Uh, She's the woman who you'll recall uh, drove the tent peg through the pagan's heart. Uh, Temple, I mean, the tent peg through the temple. And so he, in these verses, uh, he praises her. Uh, Matter of fact, he calls her most blessed among women. This is the only place in the Bible where a woman has said she's blessed. Uh, Verse 24, most blessed among women. The only other place that's said is of the Virgin Mary. So, uh, in verses 24 to 27, he's talking about her blessedness. Then in verses 28 to 30, uh, he's talking about the fact that uh, Sisera was killed. And it pictures her mother looking out her tent for her son, who's now dead. He's the pagan. And ladies around her said, well, he's just gathering the spoils of war. But that was a lie. It wasn't true. And the passage ends in verse 31. Thus let your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. And the point is, the Lord has worked. And he's punished their enemies because they're the enemies of the Lord. And those who love the Lord are to be as bright as the noonday sun, meaning they should prosper. So he ends the passage by saying, praise the Lord. He judges some people. Praise the Lord. He blesses people. Praise the Lord. So whether he's cursing or blessing, praise ye the Lord. All right. Let me sum it up. Did you get the point? What's the point? I think you got it. I'm thrilled. She celebrated the victory by composing and singing a song of praise of what God had done and what God had done through people. Let me conclude by making a suggestion. Perhaps the issue in this passage is a reflection on what I'm going to call spiritual sensitivity. Deborah, it seems to me, was sensitive in noticing what the Lord had done. In fact, some of the people didn't get it at all. She did. The Lord's working, folks. Not everybody sees it, but the Lord's working. See, she was sensitive enough to see it. She was sensitive enough to notice what the people had done, what the Lord did through them. And she was also spiritually sensitive enough to see what some of the people had not done. So it just seems to me that all of this could be summarized by saying, Deborah was sensitive, spiritually sensitive to what the Lord was doing And as a result of that, she saw what the Lord was doing, and she praised Him. Let me put it like this. I think on one end of the spectrum are people who are totally selfish. They are self-absorbed. They only think about themselves. And on the other end are people who are selfless. They think about other people. They don't think about themselves. And some are willing 
to give of themselves even to the point of risking their lives, as it says in this passage, to just be a blessing to other people. These selfish people are the insensitive people. Listen to them. All they do is talk about themselves. And these people, on the other end of the spectrum, are spiritually sensitive to what the Lord is doing and are aware of how the Lord is using people and he blesses them. The people on the selfish end are just, a, they're totally absorbed with themselves. It's like the little boy who said to his father, let's play darts. I'll throw and you'll say how wonderful. <laughs> That's all they think about. I'm wonderful. Do you recognize how wonderful I am? And the people on the other end of the spectrum say, I see how wonderful the Lord is, how the Lord is working. And they are constantly saying, I praise the Lord, and I'm thankful for what he's doing in the lives of people. They appropriately praise the Lord in front of other people. I mean, that's what this song is about. She composed the song... And she and Beric sang a duet and wanted everybody to hear it. So she's praising the Lord in the presence of other people. Now here's my question. Where are you on this scale? One end is totally selfish and the other is totally selfless. I would like to suggest this is a sliding scale. I think I know somebody who's, I don't know many, but I know one or two that are on that end of the scale. They are so self-centered that all they can talk about is themselves and how hard they're having it. You ever know, you know anybody like that? I'm the victim. Woe is me. Nobody has ever had it as bad as me. You know. I know a few people like that. And some of them, some of them aren't claiming victims. The other in that crowd say, you know how great I am? Have you noticed how good looking, how intelligent? How, have you noticed? And that's the people on that end. And on this end are people on, how are you doing? What can I do for you? Praise God for you. Now what I'm asking you is, where are you? Well, most people would say, well, I'm not over there. Even the people that are over there would say they're not over there. That's their problem. Or are you on this end of the scale? Well, nobody would say I'm totally over there. I, I do some of that, right? And that's my point. This is a sliding scale. So let's be generous and gracious and say that most people are probably what? Eh, 60 to 70% on this side of the scale? And some people are, let's say, 20 to 30 percent on this side of the scale. Meaning 20 to 30 percent of the people praise the Lord about 20 to 30 percent of the time. And some of the people uh, praise the Lord about 60 to 70 percent of the time. And if you're really spiritual, maybe 80. Am I making sense? So what I want to know is, which one, where, where are you on the scale? How often do you praise the Lord? 50 percent of the time? You praise the Lord every day? 60? 10? 80? Well, here's my challenge. Figure out where you are and make it your objective to increase it by 5% in the next week. Uh, matter of fact, I'll go 6. 6%. And here's what I really have in mind. Figure out how you can praise the Lord on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday. Is that 6% or 6 days? And when you go to bed at night, if you've missed, lay there and thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. And if you can't sing when you're in the shower or in the car by yourself, sing a hymn. Sing the doxology. Folks, I say, we need to praise the Lord. I've said that a lot today, 
I meant to be repetitious. Did you get the message? All right, now let me explain something. I preach through books of the Bible. If I decided to preach through the book of Psalms, there's 150 chapters in the book of Psalms. It's the longest book in the Bible. Virtually every chapter is saying, I am in a mess. Lord, deliver me. And when you do, I will praise you. Now, let's suppose I preach through the book of Psalms straight through. One psalm a week. How long would it take me? Just shy of three years. If I took a two-week vacation every year, it would take me three years. And in virtually every one of those sermons, I would be saying the same thing. And that is, praise the Lord. Are you getting the message? God wants us to praise Him. And He says it over and over and over and over. I've got to do it 150 times. And over. <laughs> Will you praise the Lord more this coming week? That's your goal for the week? And collect something that you can praise the Lord for next Sunday. Amen. Amen. amen and amen. Let's pray.